Friends, our modern world is topsy-turvy, isn't it? We live in a crazy world that turns things on their head. For example, our mad, twisted world labels bad things as good and good things as evil. And so there's often little sense of shame over blatant sin in our society in this day and age. When people are involved in idolatry, immorality, criminality or vulgarity, often they're not ashamed of it. And they can be quick to jump to their own defence or to make excuses for themselves. But that's not the way it should be. Indeed, it's the height of folly. For every one of us lives our daily lives before the all-seeing God of heaven and in his eyes, the eyes of the Holy One of heaven, there are countless sins that we should be utterly ashamed of. If we are wise, we will confess our sinfulness with honesty and humility before our righteous God, will sorrow over our sin as we cast ourselves upon God's mercy through Christ. Friends, to be ashamed of our sin and iniquity is a vital and positive aspect of Christian living. Mourning over our sin. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Jesus says, for we'll be comforted. But friends, there's something we must not be ashamed of. There's something that we must never, ever apologize for. Paul tells us what it is in verse 16, where he declared emphatically, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And this is what I want us to focus our attention on here this evening. As a gospel congregation in Belfast, we must never, ever be ashamed of of the gospel for as a congregation of Christ's people this is our identity we are a gospel church a gospel people this is our reason for being this is why God has established us here as a congregation in not bracken that we make his gospel unashamedly known through our corporate life together for his glory when Paul wrote these inspiring words, he was contemplating a trip to Rome, to the capital of the vast Roman Empire. Well, as he planned for such a trip, Paul might have been tempted to be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Well, for one thing, what was the gospel all about? The gospel was all about a poor Jewish carpenter. And Paul knew that Romans had little time or respect for the Jews, no love for them. And so naturally Rome would have little time to hear a message about a poor Jewish carpenter, and especially about a poor crucified Jew. Because in Roman eyes, crucifixion was the worst form of execution for the very worst of criminals. And therefore Paul could have been tempted to think to himself, the Romans would just dismiss the gospel about a crucified Jew and ridicule it. Paul could have been tempted to think that there was no point in preaching the gospel in Rome, that nobody would ever take it seriously. And what was more, Rome was the proud capital city of the world dominating Roman Empire. Well, in stark contrast, the gospel came from Jerusalem, the capital of one of the smallest nations Rome had conquered. So surely the Romans, Paul might have thought, would view the gospel as coming from the back of beyond as a total irrelevance to their sophisticated society in Rome. Then too, in Rome, there were many influential philosophers and philosophies this gospel about a poor crucified Jew rising from the dead would surely sound so foolish and ludicrous to the intellectuals at Rome, Paul might have been tempted to think. Compared with the popular philosophies of the day, the gospel would probably sound so primitive in the reasoning of the Romans. And the city wasn't just full of intellectuals. Rome was also full of aristocracy. And Christians, for the most part, in the first century, were not aristocrats. Most Christians 
were not from the elite, from the upper classes in society. Indeed, the vast majority of Christ's people were ordinary folk like us, and some were even slaves. And so as Paul headed for Rome, he might have been tempted to be ashamed of the gospel for this and all these reasons. But the apostle wasn't one bit ashamed of the gospel. Paul had complete confidence in his message. And here in the opening 17 verses, we see reason after reason after reason for Paul's total trust in the gospel. Friends, here in Belfast, in this vital ministry and mission work that we're engaged in together, never lose sight of these reasons that the Apostle Paul gives us why we can have total confidence in the gospel. Last week we thought about a man and his mission. Tonight we're thinking about his message, his message of the gospel, and why you and I can have total confidence in this gospel message that he has recorded for us here. Paul, first of all, highlights the source of the gospel. Where did this gospel originate? Paul tells us in verse 1, its origin was in heaven. The gospel came from God. Look at what Paul writes here, calls the gospel here, the gospel of God. Friends, the Romans had their illustrious emperors, and these emperors sent out messages for their people, and these messages would immediately get the attention of everybody in the empire because they were from the emperor. Well, the message of the gospel comes from who? This gospel is from the emperor of all emperors. This gospel is from the king of kings. How could Paul possibly be ashamed of such a message? The king of heaven himself was behind it, not just some earthly emperor. Friends, unsurprisingly, God is the most important word in this letter, the epistle of Romans. This epic epistle is all about God. God's name is mentioned no less than 153 times in Romans. And therefore, on average, God is spoken of in this letter in every 46 words. And so the good news of the Bible is the gospel of God. Friends, the apostles didn't invent the gospel. This message was revealed to Paul and his fellow apostles by the Lord of heaven. The living God entrusted this gospel to them. Now, it's crucially important that you and I grasp this point. Indeed, this truth must grip your heart, for this conviction underlies all authentic evangelism. We have been given a message from heaven no less. What we have to share with our fellow men isn't just human speculation or people's ideas or man's wisdom or just our own thoughts. And our message is not just one more religion to add to the list of others. For it's the very gospel of God. It's God's own good news for our lost world. And it's absolutely essential that you're fully persuaded about this. Because if you're not convicted of this, you'll not really engage yourself in evangelism. You'll not give yourself to spreading this gospel. And so this truth must get a hold of you first and foremost. The message of salvation through Jesus alone is from the Almighty, El Shaddai, the living God. The great Jehovah is the one behind this gospel. The sovereign Lord is the one who designed and declared this good news. It's from nobody else but from him. Well, Paul was fully persuaded about this fact. The apostle was completely convinced that the gospel he had received was from heaven. And so Paul wasn't ashamed one bit to declare this gospel to dignitaries as well as to down and outs. Paul unashamedly proclaimed this gospel to kings and queens, to governors and rulers, to judges and magistrates, to religious authorities and church leaders, as well as to ordinary folk like us. Just think of how Paul spoke so passionately, persuasively and pointedly to King Agrippa 
In Acts chapter 26, Paul wasn't intimidated or overawed by royalty. No matter who stood before him, Paul proclaimed God's gospel. And that's how it must be with you and me. There must be within us a burning desire to pass on this gospel, even if we're standing before royals, our presidents, our prime ministers, our chief executives, our managing directors, our top scientists. For the gospel is from the very king of heaven. It's God's message to this lost world. But Paul not only knew the source of the gospel, what also gave him complete confidence was that he knew the surety of the gospel. He knew the gospel is 100% certain because the gospel is built on God-given promises. And Paul knew that these promises from heaven were rock solid because God never, ever breaks his promises. And so the apostle had complete confidence in the surety of the gospel. In verse 2, Paul wrote about the gospel God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Friends, God revealed the gospel to the apostles, but the gospel didn't come to the apostles as a complete novelty. God had already promised a saviour through his prophets. The Old Testament kept pointing forward to the coming Messiah, right from the word go, from Genesis chapter 3. And so there's perfect continuity, do you see, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus himself was totally clear that the Old Testament bore witness to him. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus declared, it's the scriptures, that is, it's the Old Testament that testify about me. And then on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached. And as he spoke of Jesus' resurrection and exaltation, he quoted the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Peter quoted God's prophet Joel. And he also referred back to God's prophetic promises given through King David in Psalm 110 and Psalm 16. And then in Acts chapter 17, we're told how Paul himself evangelized. The apostle reasoned with the Jews in Thessalonica from the scriptures, explaining and proving from the Old Testament that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And then Paul declared passionately, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is this Christ. Friends, we should be so thankful. The apostles in the New Testament tell us the gospel. The prophets in the Old Testament give us the very same gospel message. There's a total consistency throughout Scripture concerning the gospel of God. Both Old and New Testaments together bear witness to Jesus Christ. This should give you and me tremendous confidence and assurance. This should bolster our confidence in the gospel still more because the Lord has given us the same message throughout the Bible from start to finish. There are 66 books in this inspired library. These 66 books were written over a period of about 1,500 years. And so God inspired about 40 different men in different generations. And as the centuries passed, his revelation from heaven unfolded and progressed. And throughout his revelation, there is the most remarkable unity. It's truly supernatural. This entire volume, it's an absolute miracle we have in our hands. It's completely inspired from start to finish. It's utterly unique. There isn't another book like it. And it's totally trustworthy. You can have complete confidence in its reliability. And so along with the apostle, you and I can declare with all your heart, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For along with him, you know the source and the surety of the gospel. The third reason why Paul wasn't ashamed of it is he also knew the subject of the gospel. He knew personally the one whom the gospel is all about. He knew Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as his Savior and Lord. Friends, the gospel is a person. And the person is a man who's also God. Look at the end of verse 1 and at the start of verse 3. Leaving out verse 2, how does it read? Verses 1 into 3, we're left with the statement, 
that Paul was set apart for the gospel of God regarding or concerning his son. Glance down to verse 9. There the gospel of God is described as the gospel of his son. It could not be clearer. God's good news, it's all about Jesus. John Calvin put it this way. The whole gospel is contained in Christ. The whole gospel is contained in Christ. And so to move even a step away from Christ and the amazing grace God freely offers us in Jesus means to withdraw oneself from the gospel of God. Note how Paul speaks of Jesus in two distinct ways here. First in verse 3 he talks of Jesus being descended from David, the son of David. In this way Paul highlights his humanity. Friends, many of us are interested in our family history. Some years ago I spent time investigating my family tree. I found it intriguing. We actually are coming from uh, the family line called Jean Frey, with a, an acute at the end. Uh, we're from France, the Huguenots. I haven't got that far back, but that's where we're from. Well, Jesus had a family tree, and his ancestry is recorded for us in the Bible. Therefore, we can trace Jesus' human history right back. We can see he's a direct descendant of King David. And so Paul speaks of Jesus as the son of David. And then in verse 4, he talks of Jesus as the son of God. Throughout his life, Jesus walked in this world as a humble servant all the way to the cross. Most people did not realize his true identity as God's son as he headed for the cross. But after his crucifixion, he was raised from the dead. And in this way, his deity was displayed and declared. Through the triumphant resurrection, Jesus was proclaimed with power to be the Son of God. And so his true identity was disclosed. After his resurrection, Jesus was seen by hundreds of his disciples over a period of 40 years, 40 days. And then he ascended in the Shekinah cloud back to glory to be enthroned at the right hand of his Father in heaven. Pentecost followed when the Holy Spirit was poured out on his followers. And with the outpouring of the Spirit, over the past 2,000 years, the number who can now see Jesus' true identity has multiplied exponentially. Indeed, a vast, vast multitude across the globe this very night realize who Jesus Christ is, and submit to him as their Lord and Saviour. Now, because by his resurrection, Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God, the resurrection was the turning point in Jesus' life here on earth. Before the resurrection, Jesus was not the Son of God in power and glory. He was the Son of God in weakness and in humiliation. He lived as a suffering servant, foretold by the prophets, and willingly, he was utterly humiliated as he set his face to go to the cross. At Calvary, he bore the most harrowing, horrifying punishment imaginable. Upon the terrible tree, he endured the very horrors of hell as he was punished for all of my sins and for all the sins of all of his people in every generation. What utter humiliation and horror Jesus Christ suffered. But then, through his glorious, triumphant resurrection, Jesus was declared to be who he always was. Raising him back to life, his father announced Jesus to be the Son of God and power to all creation, to the entire cosmos. And so Jesus, the Nazarene, is a human historical figure, and he's the Christ, the promised Messiah, the triumphant, victorious, ascended, exalted Saviour, reigning supreme. And by trusting in him as your crucified, risen Redeemer, you, yes, you are able to declare him as the Lord who saves and who owns and who rules your life. Friends, this is the one at the heart of the gospel. This is the one whom the gospel is all about. Jesus is the subject and centre of the gospel. And he's incomparable, isn't he? 
He is in a league of his own. There's nobody in all of history who compares with him for a millisecond. Jesus was fully man and fully God at the very same time. And so he alone is worthy of your wholehearted allegiance and all of your worship. How could you ever be ashamed of him? His attributes are overwhelmingly awesome and glorious. He's in complete command of his entire creation. For he's almighty in his power. And he's been given absolute authority over all things. He's the sovereign of the universe. And he's stunning in his supremacy and splendor. His majesty is just mind-stretching and heart-humbling. Because he's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He's the governor of all governors. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. What a contrast to the governments of our world. Who are here for a few short years and then gone. What marks those who govern the nations apart from their brief time in power? Well, on the one hand, there's their weakness and inability to sort out of society's most pressing problems. On the other hand, there's their own corruption and unrighteousness. How utterly different from King Jesus, who governs with almighty power and unlimited ability and perfect righteousness and justice as he works out his marvelous and mysterious purposes in our fallen world. <laughs> Friends, think of the one in government right now tonight who is pure to the core of his being. This is your savior, King Jesus. Think of the one in government tonight who's full of power to carry out his wonderful purposes. This is your savior, King Jesus. Think in the one of the one in government tonight whose every word is true. This is your saviour, King Jesus. And every declaration he makes displays his infinite wisdom. Every decision he takes flows from his unlimited discernment. This is your saviour, King Jesus. And yet having listed all these superlative qualities about Jesus, I haven't even mentioned the most astounding, wonderful aspect of this king's character. For this king, almighty in power, perfect in righteousness and justice, and infinite in wisdom, is also a king of astonishing grace. Which brings us to the fourth reason why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He knew the saving power of the gospel. This king is a king of incredible kindness. In his perfect holiness, this king is amazingly gracious to sinful rebels like us. In his absolute purity, this king extends the most marvelous mercy to all of us who repent of our sinful rebellion against him. In his amazing love, this king came to serve and to save his sinful lost people, laying down his life for us. And when we repent and rely upon him alone to save us, he not only welcomes us into his kingdom, he actually adopts us into his very family. He makes us his children to sit with him at his table. And he showers us with the most extravagant love and every spiritual blessing day after day. Friends, what a gospel we have in our Savior, King Jesus. This gospel is the power of God for salvation. The potency and the transformative dynamism of this gospel is immeasurable. For the saving power of the gospel brings lost sinners like us from death to life. Through this gospel, the miracle of new birth takes place within us. And we're made into new creations in Christ. Through this gospel, we are brought from darkness to light. And we're transferred from the broad road to hell onto the narrow road to heaven. And so this gospel totally transforms our standing before God in this life and eternally. And this gospel transforms our lives day by day. Having saved us, this gospel sanctifies us. Having converted us, this gospel changes us to be Christ-like. And this gospel also transforms our destiny in the life to come. We can look forward to the return of our King and to the end of this age. Because at the climax of world history, 
our reigning Redeemer will return in awesome power and glory, and he's going to renew everything. He will execute perfect justice as he judges all mankind. And he will usher all of us who know and love him into the glory of the new creation, the saving power of this gospel. Well, this brings us finally to a fifth reason why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. Apart from knowing its source, its surety, its subject and saving power, he was so persuaded about the scope of this gospel. Verse 16, this gospel isn't limited in its reach. This gospel is to be declared not just to some people, but to all nations. This gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. Atheists, nominal Protestant people, Catholic neighbours, agnostic folk, people who are completely lost. This is the gospel that can bring them from death to life. It's the power of salvation for all who come to believe. Jesus was a Jew, but this gospel isn't just for Jews. This gospel is for Jews and Gentiles alike, from across the globe and from every generation, and for everyone who believes in Jesus, no matter what their culture or nationality or background or gender or standing in society, and no matter what their past or present sins, for everyone who believes in Jesus, this gospel is the power of God for their salvation. And so this gospel from God is for absolutely everybody to hear and to receive. Christian friends, why can we ever be ashamed of this gospel? Because if we're ashamed of the gospel, we're ashamed of our all-sufficient, glorious, supreme saviour and sovereign. And our king warns us sternly and strongly Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Friends, in the history of mankind, Jesus Christ towers far, 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 far above all others. There's nobody like him. Nobody comes even close and so as a gospel congregation in Belfast, our life and work and witness and worship is to be all about him. He's to be at the center stage in everything we do here together and in this community and in this city where God has placed us. That his name will be glorified through us individually and corporately. And his unstoppable, unshakable kingdom will advance and his precious church will be built and his precious bride will be beautified to reflect his likeness in increasing measure for his honour alone. May it be so. Let us join in prayer.